Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. We just want to give God the praise and the thanks for having brought us through this week. He's put food on our table. We're here, clothed in our right minds. We're able to lift up our hands and give him the praise and the glory that belongs unto his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and God, we pray that your Shekinah glory will fill this place, that it will touch each and every one of us, those who are listening over the airwaves, those of us who are here. We pray to God that your anointing will be real. Pray that the word will go forth with power, that it will break chains. We come against all the plans of the enemy right now in your name. In the name of Jesus, we can't serve a negative word. We send it back to the pit from whence it came and whence it belongs. In Jesus' name, we claim the victory that has been ours from the foundation of the world. And we thank you for the work that you're doing and that you've been doing in us. In Jesus' name, we pray and thank you. Right now, we're going to go into praise and worship. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you going to talk about a little bit more about who Catch on Fire Ministries is. Catch on Fire Ministries is committed to creating disciples of Christ. The goal based on the 
Apostle Paul stated that the work of the Christian church is to build up the body of Christ so that all may become mature Christians. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fulfillment of Christ. Our mission is to draw people to Christ and enable them to continually grow into being like Christ. Catch on Fire Ministries is composed of disciples and led by disciples. On the first Saturday of every month, we will go into the community to assist those who are in need. Catch on Fire Ministries is an affiliate of Church of God of Prophecy, Buckley St. Kitts. This church falls under the leadership of Bishop Lionel Philip Webb. And here are our worship times. On Sundays, we have worship at 9.30 a.m. Wednesdays are prayer and Bible study at 6.30 p.m. And on Saturdays, we have praise team practice at 3 p.m., all Central Standard Time. And now we'll have the offering. Praise the Lord. This is a time when we give back to God. You can give online at Catch on Fire Ministries at org, or you can use Zelle. Our email address is cofm1013 at protonmail.com. But this I say, he which sow it sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which sow it bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to contribute to your kingdom. We pray that you bless those who have to give, bless those who don't, and that whatever is given will be used for the building up of your kingdom and for the tearing down of Satan's strongholds. We claim your blessing on it that will be fruitful and multiply in your name, Jesus. So now we'll have the scripture reading from John 1 verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. And now we'll have the sermon by Dr. Novella Springat. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, for bringing us here. And I'll pray, and then we'll listen to a song that means a lot and is relevant to what I was speaking about today. Lord, we ask, say God, that it will be all of you and none of me. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you'll help your word to minister to the listeners. 
those who are here, those who will be listening over the airwaves, over the internet. We pray to God that you'll continue to let your word become life and and you know everything that we need to to minister to us in a very real way. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today I'll be speaking about walk. The title is Walk on Water, and it's taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went upon a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worship him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The book of Matthew was written by the Apostle Matthew. And we look at this is a picture of how the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, looks when the storm is on it. And the next picture is a rendition of Jesus taking Peter out of the water after he began to sink. Matthew was a tax collector before Jesus called him to become a disciple. In those days, tax collectors had to be very educated. They were they knew Greek, they were literate, and they were well organized. And this is still true today. The Bible says that Matthew left all of this behind to follow Jesus. However, he held on to his skills as he became the first person to put into writing the teachings of Jesus. Matthew happens to be the second longest book of the New Testament. Only Luke is longer than it. Um, everyone, including the early fathers, state that this book was written by the Apostle Matthew. It doesn't say its name, but the early church all says that the authorship of this gospel is the, well, is the Apostle Matthew. It was first written in Hebrew and then was translated to Greek. And it was believed that it was written about the end of the first century. During the first three centuries of the church, Matthew was the gospel that was held in the greatest esteem and was the gospel that was the most quoted. It is believed that this gospel was written in Antioch. This was a Greek speaking city, but it had a substantial Jewish population. And then, those days, it was located in Syria. Now it is in the south central part of Turkey. After Stephen was killed, um, many of Jesus' followers had to run out of Jerusalem as they were persecuting them very severely. And one of the places they went to was Antioch. And they were well received there. The Bible documents in Acts 11 that it was there that we were first called Christians. Unlike Paul's writings, because Paul would say what he's writing about at the beginning of the letter, Matthew doesn't specify what he's speaking about. But the, it, he has been the subject of much study. And so, some basic themes have emerged. He, the focus of the book of Matthew is one, Jesus is the Messiah. He is Emmanuel. And while Jews and the leaders failed to recognize him as such during his ministry here on earth, 
That has nothing to do with the fact that the messianic kingdom is currently in existence. Because Jesus' life, ministry, death, resurrection, and exaltation brought this kingdom into existence. And this messianic reign is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Anyone who recognizes Jesus as Lord, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, uh, become members of this messianic kingdom. And while these disciples will encounter persecution as they proceed to live out the commandments of Jesus under the new government, they still are part of this kingdom. Matthew happens to be the only gospel that mentions church and the kingdom of heaven. Of the four gospels, it's unique in this respect. And this story that we're looking at today takes place immediately after the miracle of the 5,000 when Jesus took five loaves and two fishes and fed much more than 5,000 because those days they only counted the men. He counted five, he fed 5,000 men, but there are also women and children there. So he fed a, an incredible amount of people. And this brings us to a scripture today which says, immediately, Jesus made disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. This story of the, five, of the feeding of the 5,000 can be found in the other Gospels. And when John speaks about it, he says that immediately after Jesus had finished feeding these people, they thought it was a great idea for them to crown him king. They were going to make him king over Palestine, whether he wanted it or not. They, John actually said they were going to use force to declare this is the real king. The rest of you who are not doing anything for us, we're getting rid of you. This Jesus is going to be king. And the scripture says that Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Uh, the word that is translated here, the Greek word, means to compel to necessitate, he, he commanded them, you got to get into this boat now. They might have gotten caught up in the excitement, and like the, the other people, they might have thought, this is a great idea, if Jesus is king, that means I'll be great too. And they knew, like I do, that he's greater than any king that walked the face of this earth, like we all do. So they were all in for it, but Jesus was not into that. So he told them, get in the boat, go over to the other side. I'm going to join them. Now from the scripture, we can tell they were on the east side of the lake. This lake of Genesaret, as it's termed here in Matthew, elsewhere in the New Testament, is referred to as the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. It is the same lake. And they were doing like we do in our country when we take a boat between St. Kitts and Nevis. They were taking a boat from one side of the lake to another. It wasn't their boat. It was these boats ran regularly between um, different sections of, of, the, of the lake. And the, the scripture says, after he had sent the disciples away, Jesus went and dismissed the crowd. That means whatever he said to them, he got them back on the control, he calmed them down, and uh, they went their way. And the scripture goes on to say, after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Now we find that Jesus didn't take a couple of the people who were willing to blow up his head and say, oh, you're the greatest ever. He left everybody. He sent them away. He knew that pride, the Bible says terrible things about pride. It says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. You know, that's what the Bible says. It's the English proverb that says, pride go it before fall. The Bible says, pride go it before destruction. You know, it's one of the worst things that a human being can get caught up in. Pride, self-boastiness, you know. So Jesus wasn't having none of that. And, cause, and it does not help us spiritually to be caught up in what other people are saying about us, how great and how grand we are, because the Bible says that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So Jesus didn't get into this ego and pride thing. He went up in the mountain by himself. He didn't even walk with his disciples. He went 
alone before God, to bend his knee to God, to humble himself to the Father of heaven and earth. He wasn't going to be taken up with what human beings were saying. The only praise that matters is the praise of God. It's what God has to say about us that we need to be concerned with, not with what others say. And Jesus prayed. He was a man of prayer. We find him praying all to the t- all to the New Testament. And he prayed more, the greater the cause. Before he picked up the 12 disciples, he spent all night in prayer. Before he um, was going to be cru- uh, go through trial and crucifixion, he went apart from the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed as well. We find Martin Luther, who started the Reformation. It is said he would pray every day for two hours in the morning. And if he had things that were going wrong and a lot of things were happening, he would pray even longer. Because prayer is what God has called us to do. To implore him, to plead with him for whatever we need or what we are asking for in our lives. The scripture says later that night he was there alone. And night for the Jews at that time could mean either from 3 to 6 or any time after 6 in the night. So he was, either way the day had ended. He went to the mountain to pray alone. It's okay to come together for corporate prayer. But solitary prayer is what builds us spiritually. We must learn to follow the example of Jesus. We must do like him and spend time praying all by ourselves, seeking whatever we need. One of the things that they taught me when I went to school was to write down what I'm praying for. And I found that that is very, very helpful because one, when it's answered, you have a record that you did ask God for prayer and you can keep praying certain things I pray for over and over the welfare of my children the welfare of those I love you know the welfare uh, that the God I will be used of God so this is a practice that comes down to us from Jesus spending time in solitary prayer uh, and uh, He did it at a time when people were not busy, when it was quiet. He did it at night. David said, early in the morning will I seek thee. I find that early in the morning is the best time, is the time when I find I'm really able to focus on on God and pray for what is needed in my life. The scripture goes on to say the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. John recalls that they were around three to four miles out in the lake, in his version, in his account of the story. And the lake of Genesaret that they're referring to here was at its widest point, 10 miles in length. So they were basically in the middle of the lake if they had gone three to four miles into it. And this side that they were coming from, they were coming and they're going over to Bethsaida. There was a valley. There's still a valley. You could go to the Holy Land and see it. That's called the Valley of Shinaret. And the wind blows through the air from the Mediterranean. This valley acts as a conduit. And this is where most of the storms are stirred up from. So this, this wind was coming through with force. And they were roaring against it because they were trying to get to where the wind was coming from and it was pushing them back, you know. And not only was it pushing them back, it was knocking up the waves. Just making, in my country, we like to say the sea turn up. And it will do that. One minute the sea will be calm and next minute it will be like a storm has arisen. I've heard fishermen uh, that they went out to fish and when they come back in with nothing, they said the sea turned upon us. They couldn't fish. The sea is a force all of its own and the wind, uh, the wind was against them. The wind was contrary. Wherever they were going to, the wind was pushing them back from it. And the waves had joined in because the wind was stirring it up. And the scripture says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. The Old Testament, we find the Jews used to, used to have three watches of the night. They took 
the 12 hours from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and divided it into four hours. But when the Romans came, the Romans had four watches of three hours, and they went like this. From 6 to 9, they considered it evening. From 9 to 12 a.m., that was midnight. From 12 to 3 a.m., they called that cock crowing. And 3 to 6 a.m., they considered it morning. So, and it's believed that they called them watches because they sent out their guards, the soldiers, to keep watch for these three hours and then someone would replace you. So this is how they marked that it was time for a new person to keep watch. Uh, and so the, the King James Version says that it was the fourth watch of the night. This NIV says shortly before dawn. The fourth watch of the night is between 3 and 6 a.m. We know that they got into the boat around 3 p.m. or 6 p.m. the day before. So they had been rowing from since 3 or 6 p.m. It was now 3 in the morning or later, and they were still only halfway across. That's how much the wind was against them. It wasn't just that they had been trying for half an hour. This was almost 12 hours later, and they're only halfway there, and it wasn't getting any better. And, but we must say that they had grown in faith. In Matthew 8, they were on this same lake, and the storm rose up, and Jesus was asleep in the boat, and they woke him up. They're like, Master, we perish. And he woke up and told the wind and the waves, be still. So we don't find them saying that they were afraid of the storm. They knew that wherever Jesus was, his eyes were still on them. And so they kept rowing. They had been told, go over to the next side. It didn't seem possible. The wind wasn't helping them. Everybody might have told them, why are you going there? You can't see it's not working. But they kept rowing. Twelve hours later, they were only four miles into what was possibly a ten-mile journey. And they were still rowing. We didn't hear them getting up and turning back and saying, Oh, well, this doesn't make any sense. They were obeying the commandments of Jesus that says, Go over to the next side. I'm going to join you. Go on over. Keep the word. Keep the faith that I've given you. And the scripture says that Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of everything that was going wrong. They hadn't seen him for quite a while. He had been half a day, but Jesus was still had his eyes on them. He says his eyes are on the sparrow. He says how many, he knows how many he is on the head. And he says he watches over us. And when he saw that it was getting rough, that maybe they were getting a little weak and wondered, are we really doing the right thing? He went out to them. He, he displayed his supernatural power. He walked on the water. The master of heaven and earth. This is the water that he called forth that he divided the land from. He walked on the water. And he didn't do it when the crowd was there. So they said, oh really? He's the king we've been waiting for. Looking or walking on water after he feed us. He did it because he, the disciples needed help. And sometimes what, we, what God is sending to help us, we get scared of it. The disciples saw him and they were scared. They didn't realize that it was Jesus. They just saw what looked like the shape of a man walking on water. And by human terms, this is totally and completely impossible. In the midst of the waves and the roaring, here comes someone walking on top of water. I would have been scared too. I know I'm the only human. And at those days, they believe in ghosts and spirit. So they believe that when somebody died, the ghost could come back and show itself to you. Only the Sadducees didn't believe that because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. In fact, this is a belief that is common across all cultures, even to today. And the Bible tells us that the witch of Endor was able to call forth the spirit of Samuel after he was dead to speak to Saul, King Saul. So there is some credibility to this belief. 
And of course, they weren't afraid of the storm. Jesus had already shown them that he could calm the storm. But they were afraid of this person. The Bible said they started crying out in fear. This was something new. You know, this is something that they didn't understand. And that's natural and it's human. But sometimes what we're crying out in fear at is the healing, is the miracle that God is sending to deliver us. Their, their salvation was in what they were afraid of. Jesus who was walking towards them on the water. But Jesus didn't leave them afraid. He said to them, he immediately spoke to them. And he said, take courage. Don't be afraid. He's, you know, he's saying the same thing he said to the woman with the issue of blood who had tried everything and nothing had worked. He says, it's not what it seemed. We're going to go outside of the human mind. We're going to go outside the rationality. We're walking in the spirit. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I need you to see me with the eyes of faith. And those words, the phrase that he uses here when he says, it is I. It's the same words that God said to Moses when he says, I am that I am. Tell them I am that has sent you. I am who is the top beginning and end. I who reign from everlasting to everlasting. Who sits outside of time. Adonai, Elohim, El Shaddai. The omnipotent, omniscient one. It is I. I am the true source of our power. All power is given unto me in heaven and his earth. What seems impossible by man, standards, God is making a difference. He's making it work. He's opening doors that we can't even see. And he tells them, don't need to be afraid. You know, if we walk in fear, you can either be afraid or you can have faith. We can't be afraid. And no matter how crazy it seems, no matter how impossible it seems, we got to keep faith and say, this is what the Lord told me to do. He told me to go over to the other side. It might look like it's not working. It might look like I'm crazy or stupid. But he told me to go over to the other side. I can't listen to the winds and the waves. I got to keep my eyes on where Jesus told me to go. I'm going to keep rowing. I'm going to keep going. Because I got to obey the voice of the master. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus had just empowered the disciples. Just four chapters ago, he told them to go out, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. He had empowered them, given them new power and authority. And the original Greek, the more proper translation would be since it is new. He wasn't doubting that it was Jesus. But he was asking him because he knew he couldn't do it on himself. He said, Lord, since it's you out there walking on the water, if you tell me to come to you, I'll be able to do it. Because you can command anything and, I can, and it can happen. That's how Peter saw the Lord high and lifted up. He knew who he was serving. He said, if you can do it and you want me to do it and I know you don't withhold anything you said your reward of them that diligently seek you tell me to come to you and Jesus said to him come he didn't say who do you think you are I'm the only one who's God here I'm the only one he doesn't want to withhold anything from those who love and seek him he wants us to come up to higher heights we have to ask for it we have to look for it we have to live right before him Jesus wants us uh, to do a great work in us. He wants to do a new thing. He's, uh, you know, there's something happening. We need to break chains. The devil is having too much sway in this world. Right now, in the name of Jesus, God, people need to start. We all need to start saying, bid me come unto you. Help me to walk on water. Help me to do what seems impossible by man's standards. Help me to do what you're calling us to do which is to walk on water and do great works for you and Peter he didn't get up and start doing things and he didn't have any calling or any right to do it he asked 
But he didn't move until God, Jesus had come. We can't run ahead of God. When it's God's time, he will give us the, 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 um, the right the right power and the right authority. Um, Oswald Chambers say, if it's of God, it's going to work. You don't have to work hard to keep it going. It's going to keep going. And the Greek word that they said Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. And the Greek word that is used for water here is actually plural. So he didn't take one step. He walked away. He was making his way towards Jesus. And it would seem that he had almost made it. And the scripture says he saw the wind. And he was afraid. And beginning to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. He became rational. He was like, I can't be doing this. This is not real. I'm not, it's not possible for me. And the wind, I'm sure that the wind came through even more severe. Maybe uh, some water splashed up in his face and he got scared. He didn't keep his eyes where he, where he needed to. All of us do that. We, we, uh, we slip, we fall, but God is a prayer hearing and answering God. And then once we cry out, he cried out and said, Lord, save me. Because he started to sink once he started thinking human thoughts about, I can't do this. The wind is too much. The waves are too much. We can't. It's, it's going to come at us. But we have to cancel every thought that's not of God. We have to bring every thought into subjection to the, to the will of God. In the name of Jesus, we have to claim authority over what our mind sees. And we have to see with the eyes of faith. If we are truly to walk on water, if we are truly to do the great works that God is asking of his people, he said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach. And teach them to observe everything that I have commanded you. This work to be done. This work that people are dying without Christ. It's not about going into a clubhouse and complimenting ourselves on, oh, we have made it, we've said the sinner's prayers. It's about furthering the gospel. Letting others know that Jesus saves. He's satisfied. He wants to do a great work. He's come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He says this is our year of jubilee. I've come to set the captive free. I've come to preach good news to the poor. I've come to heal the brokenhearted. He's come to do, make a great change in all his life, in all our lives. And they said, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. As soon as he cried out for help, he didn't let him sink a bit and said, I should teach him a lesson. Immediately. And that shows you how far Peter had walked. He had almost made it to Jesus. Because Jesus didn't have to come running or whatever. He reached out his hand. He had almost made it. You know, when the thoughts came into his mind. And it is said that Jesus said to him, O oh, ye of little faith. He didn't say he didn't have any faith. He had faith. Only two persons in the history of the world have ever walked on, G on water. One was Jesus and the other was Peter. But it wasn't big enough for him to finish what he actually asked for. But as we know, Peter went on to become uh, the outspoken leader of the Christian church. We see him preaching on the day of Pentecost. Once the Holy Ghost fell on him, he brought so many others to know him. To know who Jesus was and is. And the scripture says when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Which makes me believe that Peter continued to walk on water. Maybe Jesus had to hold his hand this time. But they had to walk back to the boat where Peter had walked from and then climbed into it. And as soon as the master of heaven and earth climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Uh, you know, and John says that not only did the wind die down, they were immediately at their destination. They moved from the middle of the lake to where they had been trying to get to for almost or more than 12 hours, almost half a day. Half a day. And those who were in the boat, 
kneel down and worship him. He says, it is believed that those who are in the boat were the people, like when I take a boat between St. Kitts and Nevis, there's a captain, there's a crewman, and whatever, those who are in the boat, because they were new to Jesus, and they bowed down. The disciples knew that he was the son of God. There was no if, ands, or buts about it. But the others who was ferrying them across, they kneeled down and worship. You are truly the son of God. And this is the first time in the book of Matthew that he uses this expression. Son of God. Son of man. Son of David. God is all of that. And if you want to uh, recap right now, he said, don't get caught up in other people's attempt to make you feel great. We work, we march to the sound of a different the drummer. The only person whose praise that we should be interested in is the praise of God. And we know that man's honor is fickle. The same people who were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord on Palm Sunday. The next week we find them saying, crucify him, give us Barabbas instead. We must keep our eyes and our mindset on God. And we have to spend time not only in prayer, but alone in prayer, seeking God's face. The Bible says that prayer, the, the example that Jesus gave was like a, a woman who needed something and he would, she would keep going to this unjust king. And the king wouldn't give her what she wanted. And eventually he got fed up and said, she's not going away, she won't stop coming, so let me just give her what we need. The Bible doesn't say pray once and say, oh, I already tell God. It says that we must earnestly seek his face daily. When it says, give us this day our daily bread, every, every day, is a day is a prayer. That means that prayer is an everyday prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. What do we need in our lives? Do we need healing? Do we need a financial blessing? Do we need grace and favor on our job? Do we need our understanding enlightened in school, in work, whatever? Whatever we need, give us this day our daily bread. The greater the challenge, the more time we need to spend in prayer. And the storms of life will come. And they're going to come. And it might look like it's not working out, like we're not making any headway. But Jesus got his eyes on us. It wasn't easy for disciples. Half of them or more, they were trying to get to the other side. Trying to do what Jesus told them to do. Because he told them, go over, I'm going to join you. He didn't tell them how he's going to join them. He just told them, go. And they obeyed. Because by then they had seen him do great things. And it wasn't up to them to make up their mind or to listen to anybody else. There was nobody that they could listen to who was on anywhere near the level of the one who said, let there be light. And there was light. And on, even as Jesus came to them in their storm, he's coming in our storms. He sees the waves. He knows the wind is contrary, but he's coming. And he, the song says, we may, he may not come when we want him, but he's right on time. When he shows up is when he is supposed to show up. And we too, like Peter, if we keep our eyes stayed on Jesus, we can walk on the waters and the storms. We can be elevated. The wind won't move us. The storms won't draw down us. Even in the storms, he said, I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. We serve a risen Savior, and his name is Jesus. For those of you who are listening, anyone who needs prayer or who wants to give their life to Jesus, I present you Jesus, the one true God, the one who cares and satisfies and gives a peace beyond all understanding. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We pray that you will minister grace to the hearers. We pray, dear God, that it will break chains, that it will loose the, the bonds of the captives, that will bring beauty for ashes, that you will go forth with your anointing on it. 
We thank you for the opportunity that we have had to live for you and walk before you. As we go into this week, we pray that you will keep us safe from all the plans of the enemy. We come against all the plans of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We pray that your protection, your angels will be over our dwelling places. And that you will keep us in a way that as we travel back and forth, as we travel on the highway, we need journey in mercies, dear God. Keep us from danger seen and unseen. And give us your peace, dear God. Let us know that our lives are in your hands. And that you're making a way where there seems to be been away. Do the benediction now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a blessed week.